I'm going to be talking about the molds for the electric eel wheel fold. But first, I want to remind you what this electric eel wheel fold is all about. It's a new mid-sized e-spinner. The bobbins will hold about four ounces, and it has this little gauge that reports the flyer speed. As the name implies, it can fold down for shipping. So both sides will fold down and they'll actually go into that bottom portion. Uh, but perhaps even more interesting than that is with the folding mechanism, it makes it much faster to switch bobbins than my previous C spinners. Now there are a bunch of other improvements, but I'll go over those in future videos. Now this prototype is 3D printed, but the final version will be injection molded. And that's a big part of why my prices are so affordable. Injection molding like this makes products much cheaper as long as you're making several thousand of them like I do. Injection molding also resorts in stronger parts and parts with better surface finish. So as long as you're making a bunch of parts, injection molding is going to be a big win over 3D printing. With injection molding, you have lots of design guidelines that you need to follow. For example, every plastic part has to have a very uniform wall thickness. You also need to add draft angles so that the plastic parts will come out of the mold. You can think of this like a bucket for a sandcastle. It's going to have a, a slant to the bucket and not just be perfectly um, square corners. Uh, another example that I have here is an ice cube tray. So ice cubes will have a draft angle and by that I mean the edges of an ice cube are not perfectly square. If you had a cube that was an actual ice cube, it would be much harder to get it out of the ice cube tray. And the same thing is true with plastic molds, but the draft angles are going to be a lot less. So small, in fact, that you will often not notice that there's even a draft angle done. The molds are big blocks of steel with the shape of the part being made cut out of the steel block. Then that void in the steel gets injection, injected with plastic. Cutting all the metal out is usually started with a CNC machine, which grinds away parts of the steel mold. After that, a second pass is usually done with an EDM or electrical discharge machining. This process basically uses very high voltage and current to vaporize parts of the metal in a way that is more precise than CNC. One big decision that needs to be figured out before the actual molds are made is where the molds are going to be split. In this example, we have a very simple part and basically each color is indicating a different region of the mold. So this part has two different uh, parts of the mold and they're just going to sort of split apart, One, this one on the top going up and then the block of steel on the bottom going down and there'll be a, a mold line right here where those two colors touch. So that's a very simple mold. Now here's a much more complicated mold and it has lots of sections of the mold. This big gray portion is going to be coming sort of this direction. And then there's going to be another steel block on the top that's going to be going up for the green. And then we've got uh, this side which is going to go out and another piece on the other side that's going out. And then there's yellow pieces on the front and back. So all of these pieces can go in different directions, but it needs to, it, all of the pieces need to come out. You can't have a mold sort of, well, you can't easily have molds fitting inside of each other. That kind of molding is generally going to be more expensive and, and not something I typically do. And I'll go through this process with all of the different molds that we're making for this product. And that's actually what I'm doing right now. It's kind of why I'm making this video. I'm going through all of these and making sure that the manufacturer and I agree where all of the different mold lines are going to be for all of the different parts. And it takes a decent amount of time. And there's definitely feedback. For example, this was the initial proposal uh, from the manufacturer. And I said, uh, this purple part uh, should uh, be done differently and they agreed that that's reasonable so now uh, because of that change we won't have this extra mold line so that's just one example of of something that I'm getting changed uh, from their initial proposal so I have them do 
uh, proposal on where the mold lines go and then I kind of review it and make sure it all makes sense for our product. And there's a couple of iterations of back and forth and we can do this quickly with models on the computer before any of the molds uh, are made because sometimes changing where mold lines go uh, requires completely new steel molds. So we want to get that agreed upon before any steel is uh, cut. Then after that, we figure out where all the plastic goes into the different parts of the molds. So like, would you rather have your injection points on the outside or on the inside of parts? So typically I'll try to put hide the injection uh, ports on the inside of parts where they're not as noticeable. Sometimes you can't do that, but if you can, it's better to place those uh, areas sort of on the inside where they're less likely to be noticed. And you also have to design plumbing for all of these blocks, sort of the gates that control how the plastic comes in and goes out. That's really complicated and a big portion of the mold design. However, the company that I use have common blocks that sort of go on to the bottom of your mold and that control that has all of the valves uh, to control the plastic flow and that's not as flexible but it is much less expensive it'll reduce the cost of the mold sometimes by 3x so that's what i go with and it's a good trade-off for me because uh, the price of the molds is pretty important and reducing those mold costs because I'm, I'm changing my parts a lot. So I don't want to lock into a single design for a decade or something. I want to be able to be flexible and change my parts as I get better ideas and the community gives me feedback. So keeping my molds uh, lower cost, even though it's not going to be quite as flexible on how the plastic flows in, is a good trade-off for me. Then when the molds are finally completed, they will make some parts and send them back to me. And usually we have to make a few little adjustments to get the fit exactly right. But hopefully at that stage, everything's nailed down enough so that all of the changes can be made on the existing molds and I don't need to get a new mold made. And that's as long as you're adjusting fit and you have uh, agreed that this is a, a critical fit area, the molds are designed so that they can accommodate those kinds of changes afterwards. This whole process from beginning the molds to finishing the molds for me typically takes two to four months and you can definitely do it faster, but then you have to pay the mold companies more money to basically get to the front of the line. And again, because I'm trying to keep all of my products affordable, I just go at normal speed. And while I'm waiting on things, you know, I'll just work on some other future project. I've always got a big pipeline of different products that I'm working on. So that's no problem for me. It just means that all of my products take a little bit longer to get done, but I think in the end they're better and they also are more affordable. Hopefully this explains a little bit about the ejection molding process and gives you a little glimpse into the sorts of things that I'm uh, working on right now. Thanks for watching.